We're all taught how to live our lives and what it takes to be successful. But at the end of the day, what is it really all about? You have something special within you, something greater than yourself. Look beyond what's in front of you and realize that you are put on this earth for a specific purpose. And in order to discover that, you have to start talking about it. And that starts now. Living Authentically with Gina Mazzetti. Thank you for joining us today and welcome to the second episode of Living Authentically. To get us started, let's begin by exploring into personal authenticity and how it can positively impact the lives of others. It is when we honor our purpose, we are able to enlighten and strengthen our friends, our loved ones, and our peers' lives. This sounds like the perfect painted picture, but to be honest, it can be tough. I say this because we are born authentic, which is great, but at the same token, we develop these things called core values, and somewhere along the line, we lose them or hide them, and sometimes we bury them because other people have taught us that they are wrong or perhaps unacceptable. It is when you are authentic, you let your core values come back to life in full swing. Look at this show as a shovel, encouraging you to dig through the dirt and find your treasures of authenticity. Growing up as a dyslexic kid, I was told my questions in the classroom were annoying, irrelevant, or just unnecessary. And in turn, I began to quiet down, to be less engaged, this enabled me to no longer be my true authentic self because I was taught it was wrong. To this day, I am still digging out that gem of authenticity and it's not easy. However, it's liberating to give myself the green light to go for it and let my unique character and personality come out to play. So on today's show, we have two phenomenal guests who are actively fulfilling their purpose and honoring their authentic truth. One, a part of a community that fortifies young women, and the other who will share snippets of her journey as a successful woman in the realization she had in the workplace because of it. So right now, I am here with my very first guest today, Chelsea Geesling, who will share her road to authenticity. Now, Chelsea is the founder of The Good Girl Comeback. So Chelsea, welcome to the show. Hi, thanks for having me, Gina. Of course, I am so excited about it. How are you doing today? I'm great, how are you? I am doing awesome. I'm actually very excited to finally be interviewing you about The Good Girl Comeback. I know you and I were able to introduce ourselves to one another about two years ago, and yeah. we've finally been able to make this happen. Yes, I, I'm, I was so excited to hear about the show, and it's it's just such an amazing topic that, that you are covering, and I think it's just something that everybody really needs more information about and, and to be encouraged along the way, so this is, this is fantastic. Oh, well, thank you so much. So let's start with that then. So can you tell us a little bit about your road to authenticity and how you got started out with this? Yeah, and, and going along that same idea, I was lucky enough to be surrounded by a group of very strong and positive women growing up, that being my family, my extended family. Um, I have a, a big Italian family and a lot of strong women in that family. <laughs> and, um, and, you know, obviously your road to authenticity is an ongoing road, and I feel like I'm still on that road. Of course. But you know, having that strong support group around me during those challenging years of middle school, high school, college, and having those touch points of being close with my gram my grandmas, my mom, my aunts, my cousins, it made it easier for me to stay true to who I was and to stay connected with my authenticity. Awesome. That's beautiful. And I also come from a big Italian family as well. <laughs> so that's great. And tell us about that you saw, I know you and I talked about this earlier, a need from the community. And so you obviously were very fulfilled growing up with your, your aunts, your grandma, and that support system. So what was the need from the community exactly? Well, as I was going through life, I took a year off in between high school and college. And I did a year of volunteer work where I learned a great deal about myself and what I wanted for myself and the person that I wanted to be in the future. and. 
along with my support group of my family, that was just an amazing educational experience for me. And after I went through that experience, I came back to the Metro Detroit area and, you know, started college and slowly but surely people would ask me, hey, can you come to my um, Girl Scout troop meeting? Can you come to my school? Can you come to this or that and share your story? And in doing so, I encountered a lot of different young women who for this reason or that reason, were struggling with their authenticity and struggling with figuring out who they wanted to be, or more specifically, knowing sort of who they wanted to be, but having a hard time um, being authentic with that. And so a lot of the girls would ask, hey, you know, is there anything I can get involved in that can help with this? And, you know, there are some great programs out there, but the girls that I had encountered had really connected with my message. And it just inspired me to start the Good Girl Comeback and to start traveling around and speaking to young women about just what you're speaking about, which is, you know, authenticity, being true to yourself and knowing who you are and who you want to become. See, that's a beautiful message, and that's one of the primary reasons why I really wanted to interview you on this show. And so can we talk more about this notion of the quote-unquote good girl? So what kind of values or characteristics does this good girl possess? Well, our tagline that I like to sum up the good girl comeback is seeing the goodness in yourself and others. And... I know that sounds simple, but it's actually, if you think about it, very challenging. There's and a lot to unpack there, for sure. There is. There is. And I love that word, unpack. Yeah. I use that word a lot because there is a lot to unpack when it comes to seeing the goodness in yourself. Because what I've learned in my own journey and then speaking with thousands of girls along the way that there are a lot of conditions that the world puts on us and a lot of pressures that make us want to stray away from the woman that we know we are and the woman that we want to become. And in my mind, seeing the goodness in ourselves, seeing the goodness in others takes a lot of work and it takes a lot of self-discovery and it takes a lot of vision. And that is what my definition of the good girl comeback is or the good girl. It's not you know, being perfect, um, you know, never making a mistake, never messing up because I wouldn't be able to lead that group then. (laughs) Right. Exactly. (laughs) But it's more of just genuinely working day in and day out to continually discover that goodness that is in each and every one of us and that goodness that's in, you know, everyone else and to see that in everybody and yourself. And I really like that. It's that whole notion of doing your work. I know Lisa Nichols is a great speaker, talks a lot about that. It's just, we have to do our work in life. And especially with the Good Girl Comeback, encouraging young women to do that, it really starts them off in a really positive tone. So my next question I want to ask you is, are some people intimidated by this Good Girl title? Like, for example, if they've made mistakes in the past or are dwelling on some regrets, do they ever ask you, like, Chelsea, do I fit into this category? Yeah, you know, some do. Once they understand what it really is all about, those those um, concerns really go away. But, you know, I, I explained that I always growing up would take that term, good girl or goody two shoes or whatever it is that somebody could have called a girl at school or sometimes called me. And sometimes I think that people use that as an insult. And what I want to do is change that mindset and think, you know what? I'm proud to be good. I'm proud to be making positive decisions. I'm proud to be working on me. I'm proud to be volunteering. I'm proud to be smart. I'm proud to be courageous. Whatever it is that you are, I want you to be proud of that. And And Chelsea, I just got the chills by that. (laughs) I mean, I'm not even in one of your seminars right now, but I'm, I'm really, I'm, I'm so touched over here because I know for me, I never felt like I fit in as a young woman because I truthfully was not into that party scene or was not that quote unquote party girl. And school was something I always took very seriously. And although I do love to have fun as well, but I totally understand what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, I, when people ask me that question, it's, Sometimes it's like, well, what is so bad about being a good girl? And of course, you don't want to put pressures on a teen. You have to be perfect. You can never make a mistake. But the connotation of good being 
something you're not proud of is what I really want to combat. Because right now, let's be honest, it's, it's cooler to be that mean girl than it is to be that good girl. And, and that's what I want to change. Awesome. So Chelsea, tell us more about this comeback. So I know you guys are doing some seminars and some workshops. How exactly is that manifesting itself? So our goal is just to provide as many resources as possible to encourage girls to see the goodness in themselves and others. So awesome. that ranges from workshops to seminars to volunteer activities. I take a group of girls to Haiti every summer to volunteer for a week. I travel all around the country giving this message. Um, most recently, we just developed an online video course, which is a 14-video course that talks about defining the woman that you want to be and, you know, figuring out who you want to be and how you're going to get there. So we offer tons of resources along with just blog posts and inspirational videos and just anything we can do to encourage this um, goodness in, in the teens of today. Beautiful. I love that. So another question I have for you is that I talk about in this show that we are given a checklist. So for example, we're, we're taught to have X amount of kids or to get your career done by age so-and-so and things like that. So how has this, you know, you have a checklist going on. How has this fulfillment piece really fulfilled your life and brought happiness? Because of course, you know, we can all value higher education, things along those lines, but the good girl comeback, it's not necessarily in the checklist, but it is that fulfillment piece for you. Do you mean for myself or what I tell yes. the girl? Yes, how has it provided fulfillment for your life? Okay, well, it's provided a ton of fulfillment for my life. But, you know, to be quite honest with you, it's something that it took me a while to jump into. As I said, I did a year of volunteer work after high school um, and going into college. And then I, I finished college. I was having a great career in marketing and journalism. And as I said, you know, people kept asking me, hey, can you come and speak here? Can you come and wow. speak there? And it just kept tugging at my heart. But, you know, as sometimes things that are we know is, is going to be a challenging project, oh, but I'm working on my career or I don't have time for that. Or, you know, we, we sometimes try to avoid the things that I think we know um, – will change us, will we'll push us, and will challenge us to be better. And so finally, um, when I met my husband, he really encouraged me a lot to jump in f with two feet. He helped me a lot with the business side of everything because that's something that um, I wasn't as familiar with. And together, um, with his support and, and with my passion, we really um, – jumped into this. And now it is such, I mean, it is my whole entire life. You know, I, I resigned from my job and now I do this full time and it is such a fulfillment and is such a source of, um, pride and, and happiness that I get. And I'm so happy that I kind of overcame my fears and, uh, took the plunge. <laughs> and I love that, Chelsea. You took it from the back burner because it's a little uncomfortable to get out of that everyday career and you put it to the forefront. I mean, that is just awesome, and I'm really excited for viewers at home to hear your story and get inspired to discover those gems of authenticity for themselves. So, Chelsea, I cannot thank you enough for being here today. So excited yeah, about it. Thanks for having me. Well, it was so great talking to you, and everyone at home, I will be right back with my next guest, Dr. Jennifer Contreras. Thank you. Welcome back to Living Authentically. We are back with my next guest, Dr. Jennifer Contreras. Jennifer, welcome. Great. It's great to be here. Yes, thank you. Welcome to the show. I'm so excited to have you on. So please tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, first and foremost, I'm mom to Antonio. He's 16 years old and he's a great kid and he has intellectual disability. And I do consider myself an inclusion advocate. But my background, I'm a first generation Filipino American. My parents came from the Philippines and I was taught as a young kid to work really, really hard, to be the best at everything, that in order for me to be successful, I had to beat out everyone else mm. and I had to be competitive. And so I carry that with me through school, 
through working in the corporate world, through working in higher education. Um, and it's something that's definitely ingrained in me. And so when thinking about living authentically, this, the, the, the way that I appear to most people is, is a very strong woman. And I say things with a lot of conviction. And what I found in the corporate world is that when you do that, um, it, it tends to put people off. And I think Sheryl Sandberg in her book um, called Lean In describes it's a this. Great book. It is a great book. And, and I really wish it had been written about 10 or 20 years earlier. Uh, but it was, you know, being very competitive, growing up to, to be taught to be the best, to compete not just with, with other women, but also with men, um, I learned to take on a very authoritative and, and really a dominating position. Um, and uh, that didn't really sit well uh, in the corporate world. And it's interesting because being authoritative, it's not a bad thing. But if you're a woman being authoritative, it gets translated much differently than if you were a male. Exactly. I mean, really what I just did is I had a lot of confidence and I had a point of view. And people would take that to be that I was very aggressive. People would actually, you know, think that I was a bitch. People didn't realize that that it was just um, coming from me. It was, a, it was a point of view that I had that I wanted to express. And it was tough for people to see that. And this was you being, you know, just very professional in your work environment, but it was perceived as something very dominating, you said? Yes, very dominating, um, maybe something that I wasn't supposed to be. I think that we all have biases and we all have our, our thoughts as to how men should be or how women should be and how should they appear, even how a leader should act. Um, but it's tough, especially when you're Asian, when you're a woman, there's a certain um, bias I think that people have and people think that you should act a certain way, that perhaps you should be a little bit quieter, that perhaps you should have a little bit more finesse rather than going at topics or going at discussions um, with full force. And I think this is really important to talk about. This is exactly why I wanted you on today's show and I'm so blessed to have you here is because personal authenticity. You know, we're, we're told to be ourselves, but then we're in this constant tension, in this pool, because when you are yourself and it's not perceived the best and this professionalism is getting translated into somebody being bossy, it's hard to find that level of authenticity. Absolutely. And I think that, you know, women get a bad rap for being this, you know, being confident exactly. in the workplace, really knowing their stuff, being well prepared. Um, I think that they get it on both sides. I think it's tough because you'll get it from men who think, who is this woman who's trying to basically, you know, boss me around or take my position, but you also get it from women, um, which is disappointing. And so you get it from women who feel that you need to be a little bit softer, that you need to do things with a, a little bit differently. And that's not to say that there are different approaches mm -hmm. and different ways and things, of course, that throughout my career, I've learned how to do. Um, but it, it is, it's unfortunate that we have these um, preconceived notions about how women and women leaders should be. I know that even when I worked in higher education, I was an associate dean um, at the University of San Francisco. Um, and uh, um, I know that sometimes when I would walk into meetings, I would be the only woman um, at the table. And so wow. a lot of times, you know, when I would come in, I'd be very prepared. I'm a note taker. Um, I'll either take notes on my computer or I'll take notes by hand. And uh, it got to the point where people just expected me to sort of be the no note taker at the meeting, almost like, you know, the administrative assistant. Just the note taker. Right, exactly. And so what I had to do to make an adjustment to that is I stopped taking in any anything to take notes. And I would sit at the table, you know, with other men and would, um, you know, would, would, uh, not take notes and and kind of try to remember what it was that was being said, what my action items were. Quickly, I would after a meeting, I would go and write them down, um, and that was really just to uh, through body language mm -hmm. let people know that that you know I wasn't a note taker, that I was a participant, an active participant in the conversation. I'm more than just a note taker, excuse me. Exactly, and I, I think that's really interesting because I know for myself, I've gone through a lot of studies in school where they have observed female discourse and masculine discourse within the workplace and different leadership styles. And so where the men's leadership style is looked up upon, where the female frowned upon. Do you have a specific example, maybe something you've gone through, maybe something that you've heard, or just an example you can provide us that it's translated differently? 
Yeah, I think that um, anything that you say directly to someone and you say with authority or you say with a lot of confidence can get misinterpreted. And without mitigation. Exactly. So rather than asking, say, for, instead of asking someone to do something. So for example, if I had one of my employees or one of the people on my staff um, and I said, you know, um, I need you to do this it would be taken very negatively, rather than if I said something like, could you help me with this? Mm. Um, so there are things that we can do to change our language. However, I think it's just unfortunate that we have to do that when a, you know a man could come in um, as a superior and say, I need you to do this, and it would just be followed. So you we're know? supposed to be much more soft yes. when it comes to communicating with peers, with people in the workplace, things along those lines. Right, and I think that there's something to be said for taking accountability for your own communication and how you make others feel. But there's also something to be said, I think, about our society and changing our perceptions of how a woman should be or how a man should be. You know, if a man said, I need your help, he would be seen as nice and compassionate, but yet still a leader. Sometimes you even get the double-edged sword if, he, if a woman came in and said, I need your help. Uh, you know, it would be seen as a sign of weakness, as if you needed help, not that in order you to were fulfill this task. Exactly, exactly. So there's sometimes a double-edged sword there, and I think that Cheryl Sandberg, in her book *Lean In*, definitely points all of this out and um, talks about ways that we can be pragmatic about um, you know changing our style if needed. But I do think that the greater concern is how do we, as a community, or as a society, or as a corporate community. Um, change the way that we see women and change the way that we view women in terms of their strength and their confidence, you know, allowing them to be assertive, allowing them to take these lead positions without it being a negative situation on their side. Now, we did talk a little bit about that term before the show started today and how I am dyslexic. I do talk a lot about that and how there's this inclusiveness going on. Can we talk more about that? Right. Inclusivity? Yeah, so um, I'm a huge inclusion advocate, mainly because of my son, and so that inclusion can be applied really to many different things. Um, the example that I liked using, I think we talked about earlier, was um, when Chris Rock made a comment about black yes. progress, yes. and uh, he said how he hated that because when you look, when you think about that term black progress, it seemed that black people came from you know not being perhaps. Um, validated or, or not being um, ready to be in politics or wouldn't, weren't ready but to take on leadership positions. Instead of, right, exactly. the community. And Chris Rock really said it very plainly. He said, this isn't about black progress. It's about white people being nicer than they were before. Exactly. It's about white people including black people exactly. um, in, in these um, powers of, you know, positions of power or in their club, if you will. And so it's that acceptance and that inclusion. And so rather than putting it on, um, you know, black people, that he put it on society as a whole. Right. Why make these people feel like the victim of it? Like we need to do something about it as a community. Exactly. We need to be more including and tell people that like how can we change instead of forcing them to change? Exactly. And the same can be applied to even people that have disabilities, you know, and inclusion. Inclusion isn't necessarily about having people with disabilities overcome whatever it is their disability exactly. is or trying to be like everyone else. Or look at this person that happens to have autism and now they're shooting baskets at the, on the basketball court like everyone else. Mm -hmm. It's not about that. It's about people around you um, making room and changing their perception of people that have a, and I even hate the word disability, because it's a, a deficit word that implies that that's all you're all about, is something that you don't have. Um, I, use, I like to call it different abilities. Um, but the same thing with women, women in the workforce. I think it's important for um, people to, you know, the, the corporate society, the community, to look at women and look at the different ways of communicating and the different styles, and really let go of some of their biases that they've had in the past, and and look at women um, with with admiration for their strength and their ability to communicate and be great leaders. And I think that's such a great point, especially because I am a communication studies major at San Francisco State University, and I do find that you learn so many different communication strategies and styles, but when you do use them in the workplace, and I do try to explore during different jobs, things like that, and it is perceived a little differently. And that can be tough because you do try to be your authentic self, but at the same time, be more professional, be more confident within yourself. But then also it's that whole struggle of you have to please other people, you have to not step over too many boundaries, and so that can be tough.
It can be tough. And it's really, um, you know, it's, it's something I think that's changing. I think there are more people who are aware of it. Um, but I also think that there's, that there's a lot of work to be done. You know, whether it's women, whether you're looking at people of different races. And what kind of work? Can you go more into that? Um, in terms of? In terms of like what you said, different races, uh, the community, what kind of work needs to be done? Yeah, I do think that, I think shows like this really bring that topic to the forefront. So I think that that's great. I think that people need to um, go through, um, you know, even an immersion of understanding. Um, you know, when, when you talk about leadership and you talk about followership um, and you're teaching this perhaps in your business schools, I think there needs to be an emphasis on how that pertains to people of different genders, of different abilities, of different races, just diversity in general. I think that there needs to be more work done in, in schools to educate people. And then I just think that there needs to be practical application and training within corporate communities. So more, when I say more work needs to be done, it's something that's active and something that has to be um, in the forefront of people's minds because we are so ingrained in perhaps our family life or, or how we are um, perhaps at home or what we grew up with in our particular background. Um, I know that for me, my mom was a very strong woman, she still is, and uh, my dad is equally strong. They have a terrific partnership. But I do know that she comes across sometimes as arrogant or she can come across as a little bit, um, uh, you know, what people will say is overbearing. Does she have that same leadership style or a similar one? She does, she does. I mean, she's very confident in what she says. She has a point of view and has an opinion. And so I think I get a lot of that from her. <laughs> um, and that's just how I grew up. And, and then on top of that, with playing competitive basketball in high school and also on crew, and, and really all of my mentors, most of my mentors until recently, being male and being in, in leadership positions, this was the example that I had to follow. Even the books I read in business school, I, I, I was a big fan of Jack Welsh. So this is what you've been taught. Exactly. And so and you know, Jennifer, thank you so much for today's interview. I think you shine light on a lot of different things. Both you and Chelsea did teach us that we have to do our work regardless of what it is. So thank you guys for that. And we come back, I'll be here to wrap it up for you guys. back to Living Authentically. Today has been an awesome show. Both my guests have shared very compelling information with us today. Chelsea has exemplified the power of doing what you love in a way that betters people's lives, while Jennifer has shined light on what it means to be your authentic self and the different reactions an individual, or in this case, a woman, can get when doing so. It is my hope that this has inspired you at home to discover your gems of authenticity, just as they have. Whether it be mentoring young women to be their best selves or embracing your core values regardless of what society says. So I now would like to pose a question to you. What are your core values? The ones that are buried or perhaps the ones you have ignored. You know, the ones your parents weren't too fond of or the quality your boss didn't particularly like, or maybe the one your partner encouraged you to hide. Now write down five of them and ask yourself this, what's preventing me from practicing my core values? This new year, I encourage you to focus on bringing these skills, these amazing qualities and these gems back to life. Not to prove your enemy wrong, but to live a life of authenticity. I'm Gina Mazzetti and I'll see you next time. Well,